Hello, creatives. Welcome to Girl Gang Craft, the podcast. I have Chelsea here today, and we go way back, like way, way, way back to guys and dolls in like, what, the fourth grade? Um, We did a lot of theater together. Um, We share a lot of mutual friends. Um, We shared just one part, Lena Lamont in Singing in the Rain. Yes, double casting. (laughs) Um, So Chelsea's doing some really cool things, and I'm so excited to have you here, Chelsea, today. Welcome to Girl Gang Craft, the podcast. Woo, thank you for having me. Thank you for being a girl with a gang and crafting. (laughs) Who are you and what do you do? Tell, Tell the folks listening. Wow, who am I? We're getting loaded deep. Um... I'm an actress and comedian. I also volunteer as a grief counselor. I'm originally from the Bay, not far from where you are from in Marin. And I use comedy as a lens to explore grief and perspective. But yeah, the the two main things I do are acting and grief stuff. So let's start with the acting stuff. Um, Because I know a lot of our community is like, wow, an actor, that's like a little bit different than from a lot of people's uh, world that may be listening. So tell us a little bit about that world and what it's been like for you navigating the world of L.A. It's a fun and funky time. I studied theater at USC and have continued to live in Los Angeles since. So it looks like commercials, television, film, theater and stand up. My main focuses are comedy. So the things I actively build and promote our a comedic grief podcast called dying of laughter doing stand-up around los angeles that is often grief based and it's very much a freelance lifestyle so often you have a really great year you might have a slower year it can ebb and flow but generally it gets a little better over time it is very competitive a lot of people want to do it so that's you know, good and bad, um, good in that it's, it's fun to have healthy competition and to push yourself. And then it has its challenges when you're trying to make a living and not necessarily doing that. But a lot of artists these days have multiple revenue streams. Perhaps that's relatable to those listening with multiple gigs, freelance life. So in addition to acting and doing commercials, which pays the most, I help artists grow social followings, help them build their podcasts and social media followings, which is something I think is actually fun bringing your authenticity and your real self to your social media. I know you are very gifted at that and always bringing an authentic perspective to those spaces. I also host karaoke nights for like high profile weddings and events. So I like bring karaoke to like celebrity weddings. I don't know. I've got a lot of, (laughs) I didn't know that. That's awesome. Yeah. I can never post it because it's like, private like and stuff <laughs> but like it's wild and by the way as you would know people listening would not know that I do not have a strong vocal quality like I'm very confident I love comedic rapping but like I can't actually sing so the fact that I have that job is in and of, uh, in and of itself <laughs> hilarious to me so you can't like name drop any weddings lately or anything I literally can't but <laughs> if you wonder if it's happened, it may have. I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay, so um, let's start with a little bit of your acting, and I'm really interested in also going into the other stuff too. Um, I think a lot of people listening can really understand uh the freelance life, the multi revenue streams. That's something I preach. Right? Let's not put all your eggs in one basket. Um, and you might like a new basket. You never know. Uh, so first of all, acting, what, what would we know you from? LOL. Um, (laughs) you're like, I'm not a famous actress, but most people are not. I'm currently in Wayfair commercials with Kelly Clarkson. So those are airing nationally. There's been three spots that have come out so far. So that's really fun. I think that might be it, but, um, I can share those with you to link if you'd like. Um, I have one line in this Netflix film called We Have a Ghost right now, starring Tig Notaro, David Harbour from Stranger Things, and my personal fave, Jennifer Coolidge. So that's an example of a really big booking to be in a Netflix film. And at the same time, it's one line. It's short and sweet. It's by no means a lead, but it was really fun to do. I had a small role on Barry, directed by Bill Hader. I've also done commercials for Alaska Airlines, KFC. Facebook, etc. So those are some of the things I'm most excited about. You wouldn't necessarily have known them or seen them, but um, 
it's a good time and it's taken a long time to get to the place to work I would say semi consistently but yeah you probably haven't seen those things and that's okay too I remember when your Alaska commercial came out can you was that sort of like your first major commercial that was it's a good point yes and I guess I'll say yes and like that's something that everyone saw because it was on all the Alaska Airlines planes for a summer. So if you flew Alaska at all, you had seen it. But it's funny because I have definitely had done a lot of things before then, but it's like people don't know what it is. I'm sure maybe people can relate of like you have this big project or you get a big gig or you, you know, you sold this awesome painting if you're in the craft world or you had a really big social media client, but often people haven't seen that. So I had had some successes before that but like you said you know people haven't seen it so yeah Alaska let's go with that as like a first big win it was it was really fun it was one day it was um it was hard because it was a big paragraph straight to camera and there was maybe 50 people watching me as I delivered it and often commercials you have like one line it's like short and sweet but that was like a big paragraph so that was actually a lot of pressure but I'm glad it worked out and it was fun and I'm, I'm just happy it came out so, okay, how does that work? How did you get that gig? Um, what does the, like, longevity look like with that? Um, and what's the word? Were you, like, not a commission, but I'm such a newbie. What's the- Residuals? <laughs> Thank you. Oh. Residuals. And you what does that talk- look like? You want to talk about the payment structure of the entertainment industry. It's an interesting time to do that because there is a massive writer strike due to the lack of income and the problematic systemic issues relating to residuals, which is a whole podcast but the process is you have an audition that comes through your commercial agents it is possible to audition without a commercial agent and if you're interested in doing that the websites i recommend signing up for are casting networks and actors access those are two sites where you can upload your photos and materials and self-submit which is something that i still do to this day i think as a freelancer as an entrepreneur it's always important to hustle your own gigs in addition to help you might get from referrals or agents or bosses so I think it's you know part of being like a badass and a boss babe is is hustling your own work so that's something I I continue to do uh to this day I do a lot of indie films in in different states around the country and that's usually because of a connection I've made or I self-submitted you know my LA reps are focused on LA jobs which is great but they're often the most competitive gigs so I'm like cool uh I would love to do this film in Arkansas and I'm going to self-submit to do that. So yeah, I think last year I did films in Mississippi, Arkansas, Missouri. I'm on hold for film in Minneapolis right now. So that's really fun to me. Back to your question. The audition comes through a commercial agent. Um, if you are interested in getting a commercial agent, I have thoughts on that. You need really, really strong photos and a little bit of improv experience. The photographer I'd like to plug is Leah Hubner. If you're ever in Los Angeles, I think she's the most affordable and the best. And you can take online classes at UCB or Groundlings anywhere in the country. So if you'd like a little bit of experience, I prefer in person. I think it's more powerful for something like improv. But the fact that these amazing schools do have online options is really cool. So no matter where you're listening from, Groundlings and UCB are the two schools I would plug if you ever wanted to take a Zoom class. The audition comes in. In those days, you would go in person. Now it's usually on Zoom. And you do your thing you have you know the night before you get the material you show up you dress in character deliver the monologue I did it multiple times then you come back in a second time for a callback then you are put on hold there's about two to four people that are put on hold for each spot so being on hold is like really exciting but then like really upsetting when you don't get it because you know you're holding the dates you're a top choice and I've been on hold dozens of times and you didn't get it this one I happened to get You go into shoot. It's about a 12 to 15 hour day for, as you've seen, the spot is 30 seconds. So it's a lot of time for a very short project in the end. And that project was before I was in the union. I'm in the union sag after, which is the Screen Screen Actors Guild. That was a non-union project. So residuals are significantly lower if applicable at all, which is why you want to be in the union. You'll get paid a lot more. I'm telling you, my Wayfair commercials, I'm getting paid five times five six seven eight times more than I got paid for Alaska Airlines that said they did what it's called a buyout so you negotiate up front we're not going to give you residuals but we will give you x amount of dollars and I do have good agents that were able to negotiate 
a fair rate, but I will say I'm happier being in the union. The rates are better and also qualify you for health insurance, which is very important. And the short sentence I'll say about the writer's strike is because streaming platforms such as Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon exist, there are no commercials on those platforms, which means there's less advertising, which means there's less dollars for the creatives and the people at the top get all the money and the creatives, writers, directors, actors get very little compared to what they once did on NBC, ABC, CBS, et cetera. So that's what's in negotiations right now. We'll see what happens. But yeah, that's a little peek behind the curtain of residuals for you. Thank you for that breakdown. I so appreciate it. Um, I mean, I don't my know sister- if that was interesting at all. Like, no, you it's, can cut that. I feel like a slave. It's totally it's interesting. Fun. I had my sister. My sister's also in the you know Hollywood world, um, and she, I had her record a ten minute explanation to me of what she did like last week when I saw her because I was like, can you just like break it down? I'm so interested. I mean, like as a business owner, it's so interesting to see how these different like systems work, right? And like, mm-hmm. oh, can I pull something from this like? like niche can I pull something from this and like I don't know I think it's fascinating so okay with the writer strike have like how has that affected your work currently at a halt shortly and television is kind of like the crown jewel of the business whereas back in the day films were there's a lot of nuance it depends but generally television is the crown jewel of of the industry everyone wants to do it it pays well it's the most exposure so that is going to be at a complete halt until negotiations can be sorted so you have showrunners directors writers free to live their life go on vacation except with what money because they're not getting paid so the people at the top who have money are like full-on vacation life this summer leaving the country Um, people at lower levels are getting other jobs so yeah television won't exist but indie films and commercials will and theater and stand-up so still involved with stand-up I'm still auditioning for very independent projects which is creatively fulfilling but less lucrative so it's a good time to hustle your other gigs you know I have my next season of my podcast I'm developing for the summer because it's a good time to do that so overall there's a bit of a dark cloud over the business when one of the main ways to make money is no longer existing it's not great I mean this is what happened in 2020 people were very mentally unwell for that reason I ended up taking a job at BuzzFeed during the pandemic I was originally in their talent program and I was going in three times a week to film then 2020 happened so it pivoted to virtually so I was making a lot of discrete content from home which was actually a really good gig for the pandemic and then once that contract ended I took a full-time job as a producer and I made content remotely from home conducted zoom interviews etc which was a really cool gig because I said yeah I'm available to work full-time right now um so this is like a mini version of that it's not as bad of course but The world will focus on indie projects until television can sort its prices out. So it's a little, it's a little bleak. I'm not going to lie. There's a lot of, there's a long road ahead because Netflix is such a genius business model. No one wants to pay more for Netflix. Netflix isn't going to all of a sudden charge everyone a hundred dollars a month. So it's like, what exactly are they going to do? And a little bit of this is because the world changed so quickly you know, technology and AI has advanced so fast. It's not anyone's fault. That said, we need to work with the world, not against it. And people who are at the top of these corporations are kind of like, so what? Like, if they're already making all this money, they're not going to suddenly allocate it to creatives and to people below them. So it's really sticky. But these unions, the WGA and SAG-AFTRA, WGA stands for the Writers Guild of America. There's the DGA, the Directors Guild of America, and SAG-AFTRA, which is the Screen Actors Guild, were created to protect artists and to protect creatives. So hopefully they can band together and come up with a reasonable decision. We'll see. No. So, so are you still working yeah, that was, full-time job? Uh, stopped in 2021. I in my normal life, I don't have time to work that many hours with all of my other gigs, but because all of my other gigs existed, it was just a way to pivot and be flexible. And it's like, hey, well, I might as well make more money when I can. But no, I, I don't work for BuzzFeed anymore. So my income is from acting and from freelance social media gigs. My favorite being helping artists be more authentic and grow their followings online. But I'll, I'll, I'll take other clients that don't have to be artists. I think I can help artists. Best. And then, yeah, and then like stand up, 
in theater pay very little. Live art, like live performance pays the least. I think it can ironically be the most rewarding and fulfilling. So those are things that I do um, out of love. I, I think stand up is like the most fun I've ever had. And unless you're, you know, have a Netflix special, it pays very little. Um, but then my karaoke gigs pay. So yeah, live, live karaoke weddings will still happen. I do bar mitzvahs, kids parties, Netflix rap parties, like all that stuff still happening. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what I'm doing right now. No, Wait, so it's your uh, the business? company the karaoke? Called karaoke. So I'm an employer okay. of that company, but it's all women. It's super badass. Cool. My quote unquote own company is when I do the social media gigs, which I know uh-huh. you're very familiar with. So happy to talk about that. But I don't know if that's like boring what you talk about every week. But I'm curious how you like yeah. to grow your following and how you bring your authentic self <laughs> to your work, because I feel like you're very good at <laughs> being you and bringing your personal life as well as your professional life to your social media. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I love this reverse interview. Um, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, I don't know, man, it is a wild world out there. Like every day is different with how, like how much it seeps into me or like how much I'm affected by it all. Um, And ultimately, I just try to, like, keep my head up and, like, keep posting and keep trying to, like, be myself (laughs) because (laughs) that's all I can do. And um, I think it's just been, like, a really interesting shift with, like, the TikTok world. And, um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just, like, show up. I just feel like I get, like, downloads and I, like, write a bunch of things in my notes and then I'm, like – what day? I don't know. I, you know, I have a whole system. If you, if you're listening to the, my episode before I like, I, I have a batch day. Wednesday is my content day for the most part, but then I sort of like, so do you throw film? things up and I don't no, know. I want to know. About I do strategy. have a strategy, so do but you film a certain number of videos <laughs> per week, per month. When you say batch day, tell me more about that. Yeah. So behind this computer is chaos right now because it is a batch day. Um, I'm working on apparel today, apparel um, shoot. I also have new socks. Love new socks. Um, so we're shooting some socks. <laughs> so <laughs> so there's like sequins back here. So yeah, I'll try and shoot like a bunch of content. Um, and I try to uh, like – be really organized with my folders so like if I hear a cute sound that's fun I'm like okay well this is perfect for my bumper stickers here's my already saved folder um that I can just pull into CapCut or whatever and like match it with that sound um you know I keep a bunch of b-roll I I think the the key is you know staying organized with all of your albums or whatever And yeah, I try and shoot a bunch of videos on Wednesday, depending on like what's going on in our world with launches and stuff. Um, I feel like it's been a little bit more willy willy nilly, if you will, because I've been running all over the place. Um, And um, my so I have a team member who runs our main account and then I run apparel and my personal and our TikTok. So there's a lot of sort of like switching and like miss like mixing and matching and we use Asana and we use Planoly and we throw things up and um, that's great. So you know, you're actually chaos. posting on how many accounts? <laughs> three. I guess okay. three plus like Pinterest and we have the podcast mm-hmm. on the, on YouTube, but that's like, I'm not like doing a YouTube channel yeah, properly. No, it's a lot. And, I mean, that's a lot of yeah. content yeah. coming out. It's a and lot. It's- <laughs> being really organized I've had phases where more versus less content has come out I mean yeah I I like what you said about staying really really organized and I'm sure you've broken that down in different episodes but in general you shoot a bunch of um, content one day per week and then you assort it into different folders on your iPhone you share those folders with your team member and both you and the team member are in charge of posting to approximately three different accounts plus a Pinterest plus a podcast so kind of five different accounts Yes. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I love to. Yes. Not to mention oh, our email newsletter, newsletter or our blog. To, you know. <laughs> oh yeah. 
join our newsletter. So, okay. So how did you get into like it you know, building other people's accounts? Of people are always like, how do you do this? And I would say it's nuanced. Like social media is not, it's definitely not my main focus. If it were, perhaps it would look differently, but I am an artist who shows up in online spaces I think the podcast is the most exciting thing that I do like that. I had an episode come out every week for over two years. That was like my most consistent win. I was like so into it. And then, and then I, and then I, then I said, you know, this isn't for me anymore to do it weekly. So now I do seasons. So I have between eight to 16 episodes come out in a row, but then I take a break. And I was inspired by some of my favorite podcasts are seasons. And I actually get really excited when the new season comes out. So depending on where you're at, I think something weekly can feel overwhelming to a lot of people. I'm not going to lie. Weekly is what's recommended to grow a following and stay consistent every other week. We do. We do every other week because I also can't. Yeah, no, that's still awesome. Every other week week. is still like. (laughs) a really big deal and anything you can do consistently is huge but I just always had ideas for people so I've always helped my friends make Instagram content and then I just it just happened really naturally I started to charge because so many people were asking me and if I didn't know them I would take like a quick call for free I'm like here's some ideas but if you want to you know work together more like here's what I charge I'm I'm I will be honest with you I am not great with charging like I'm pretty generous with my time and I like always am willing to help people uh for free like if you have a quick question like dm me or if if you can voice memo me your question in one minute and I can respond to you in one to two minutes like I will always do that for free but if you want to be a bad b and make like serious cash maybe don't do that so that to me that's like a revenue stream that there's times in my life is like really flowing and there's times I just like have a couple clients because it's fun to me but I always like adding value so if I can help someone bring their authentic presence to their social media or just alleviate a little bit of stress for them like I'm I'm happy to do that and there's also a lot of actresses and artists I'll say who are older that we started as a trade so like they have more connections in the industry and at first when I started I was like if you can introduce me to like some people I will help you with your social media like we're talking artists who are like very successful but you know they're older like 40 plus 50 plus 60 plus 70 plus whatever their age is they're like I don't know how to do this so I'm like cool I don't have access to these fancy people you don't have access to figuring this out so it was kind of like a trade so I would say if you want to get started with something like this or your own business what can you offer for free and what do you need that doesn't have a price tag because for me being introduced to people let's say casting directors or agents or producers there's no price tag on that like there's literally no price you can pay for introductions so I started when I was much younger doing that for free and then as you get older you're like okay I'm gonna flesh this out and make it more of an official business but you know from running your own business like it's a lot of work and it's like a lot to manage my biggest tip for people who have their own businesses is using acuity or calendly for scheduling it's just so much better so my clients are on zoom they can book when they want i remember like back in the day like before i had calendly when i started this we were like back and forth in text to choose days and times i'm like never again are are you so happy with calendly or acuity yeah oh my god i love it that's one of my biggest tips too like do not waste your time are you going thursday at 12 no how about Friday? no and my no, favorite thing is that people can you reschedule don't have time for that. on their own time because rescheduling happens. And I think yeah. depending on where you're at, mm-hmm. yeah. you reschedule today, you reschedule today. I saw right. it. And then I people got the can notification. Always come back and like, hey, that actually didn't work. But like inevitably <laughs> there will always be scheduling snafus, yeah. but you do eliminate a lot of them by being able to pick and choose on your own. And because I use Calendly for my podcast and my social media clients, I always laugh that I made the third tier that's just like generic virtual meetings. And when I have some girlfriends who live in different states, let's say, and we want to catch up and 
that are not good with scheduling, I will literally text some of my good friends, my Calendly. I'm like, don't hate me, but like, this is what we're going to need to do. And I have people that are either obsessed and they're like, wow, thank you so much. Or they're like offended. They're like, who are you? Renata Klein from Big Little Lies? Like what's happening? I'm like, sis. Really? No, that's genius. I love my friend group would love that. They would love that if I dropped a Calendly link. And it's like, listen, (laughs) I reserve it for the people that like cannot get it together. Like if you're one of my best friends, we'll just make it work. But if you're like, we're on like week five of trying to schedule a phone call, it's not happening. You're getting the Calendly link, honey. Yeah. How are, so what are some of your current revenue streams? I know you have a lot, but it might be obvious to the listeners, but I'd love if you could share a little bit more about the different pillars you're involved in. Oh my God. I love this. I love the devil interview um, or the, the both side interview. Um, let's see. So we do our craft fairs and that's the majority of our revenue. Um, and then we do classes and courses. Uh, we have a membership um, and then our apparel line and that's partnerships. I think that's it. Yeah. That, I mean, yeah. And then like our, we do like an online directory, um, which kind of like files under that's a um, lot. And so at this time, you're not doing one to one clients. So like if they want to be involved in the membership or the courses, otherwise, you're focused on your, your craft fairs. That's the main so thing I, you're doing. Yeah. So I do one on one coaching. Um, I do offer that. I mean, I also offer like Instagram audits. Um, so there is some like one on one ways to book with me. Um, but most yeah people do like one-off coaching so I mean I've done group coaching before and like you know six-week courses and that actually did really well during pandemic times but I think people actually at least my experience lately with our community is that people kind of like want to do like a one-and-done situation people don't want to be on zoom anymore um which I think is unfortunate because I think there was a lot of really beautiful things that happened on zoom um but yeah, I think people want it a little bit yeah, quicker Yeah, I think now. it depends. I, I, I've, I have found people – I haven't found that. I feel like people are down for Zoom, but that's because I'm not like – I don't okay. have like a full online business with like a bunch of Zoom classes. So you're right. I think people probably got hit harder post-COVID, but that's cool that there's ways to book with you. And I just wanted to compliment – your craft fairs because I went to one in Los Angeles. It was so impressive. It was massive. There were so many vendors. I was yeah. like, how did you find all these people and schedule them? And like, how does that, yeah, how does that even come to be? It was such a massive undertaking. I thought it was really impressive. Thank you, LA. Yeah. Um, um, I mean, <laughs> how do we do it? I don't know. Um, I mean, we've, you know, we've been in, we've been a craft fair for six, six years now. So people have heard of us through the internet. We also do some reaching out to people when we're like in new spaces. Like for instance, we're in Providence, Rhode Island now, and you know, we're not a member of the community yet. So we do a lot of outreach and ads and like teaming up with organizations to get people to know about our show. And then we have to get people there, which is harder than getting vendors there because vendors like opportunities and it's hard to get people to do anything. And that's one of the reasons why we're not in LA anymore because specifically Mm -hmm. it's hard to get people in LA to do anything. What are some ways that you (laughs) Um, get people there? There's natural foot traffic that people are in the area. So I imagine one of the key factors, there's this finding a location where there's going yeah. to be people, but what are you specifically doing on your own to totally. get there? An email newsletter, social media outreach. What does that look like? Yeah, all of it. So here in Salem, there is a lot of foot traffic. That's one of the cool things about summer here because it's a destination and we're right downtown and there's like always things happening and people are walking around like weather pending. Um, But yeah, I mean, I'm a big Facebook event ads person. Like, I'll throw some money behind a Facebook ad. Um, But it's wild. Like, that ad money goes so much further here in Salem than Oakland, California. Like, I'll put, like, three times the amount in Oakland, and it's still, like, maybe half the amount of people, like, RSVP through that ad versus Salem. Like, people over here are a little bit more hungry for it. Um. And then we do like newspaper listings, like for any event that you throw, um, you can always post on newspapers for free, um, online. 
And so you like want to, you know, you want to get show up in that SEO. Like, what is there to do this right. weekend? And then you want your event to show up. Um, so we do that. And then social media, email newsletter, um, Eventbrite. What else do we do? Sometimes we put out ads. Like, we'll be putting out an ad in one of the Providence magazines for the holidays. Um, I think in the past we've done, like, some influencer engagement. And we'll probably do that again for the holidays. Um, we also do like a goodie bag so for the cool. holidays. It's really to interesting in the door. to hear. Um, it's like you know, but you don't know, and just such a good reminder about newspapers. And why do you think there's been more success in Salem than Oakland? My my theory is that it's just a little bit of a smaller yeah. town. Like Oakland just has so much going on. But what do you think? Yeah, and I want to throw in one more thing to the last question too. I'm a big proponent of flyers. Like flyers are not dead. A paper yeah. flyer goes a long way in a public place. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, Salem's interesting because it's a of small course. town, but there's still a lot going on here. Um, there's always – first of all, there's tourists. So it's just like there's always like a demand for things, activities to do here in Salem. Um, and, yeah, I think – well, in, in the Bay Area, right. it got really saturated. There's tons of craft fairs there. Um, and there's still craft fairs here. There's a lot of craft fairs in the Boston area. Um, there's not really like a femme, there's no other femme forward. Well, there's one other women's market actually over here, but I think the political thing hits a little bit harder over here than in the Bay area. Um, it's a little bit more like seen that done that over in Bay in the Bay. And here it's like the uterus pin, for instance, that we do is like a little bit more controversial or like. Um, I don't know. There's just like a slightly different, pol- I mean, Salem is like a liberal bubble, but there's still some non-liberal folks in adjacent mm-hmm. cities or like nearby or in town or whatever. So I think it's just like, I don't right, know, maybe just Oakland a little bit more empowering over here. The liberal bubble of liberal bubbles. There's no one even nearby that is not yeah. liberal. I mean, that's a generalization. Yeah. There's, of course, everyone is everywhere. But generally speaking, yeah, Oakland is just yeah. so liberal. It's like, yeah, we see uterus pins. Like, we are the uterus of the world. Like, we are a uterus. And Salem's like, I'm into a uterus. Like, let me touch the uterus. And Oakland is like, I am a uterus. <laughs> hilarious yeah and it's so interesting another like random thing like our you know Salem is super witchy right so everything's like um like black and dark product kind of thing and then our pink product does really well over here maybe because it's like different and it's Mm -hmm. like pink and witchy rather than like dark and witchy I don't know so I think it's really it's really fascinating to do location-based business right um because it's just different than online. And I think it can be really fun and um, potent to like have a local sort of business plan and also have an online business plan. And they might be totally different. You know, really talking to people in different spaces can be really important. I mean, like, even like you said, you know, doing your LA projects versus, yeah, no, you know, in other states. It's so interesting. Yeah. California is just very saturated. It's very competitive. There's a lot of people and a lot of people with similar interests and big dreams and big bucks. So I think it's cool to expand. And how cool that you are bi-coastal. You've had experience in California and now on the East Coast. And like you said, you're expanding to Rhode Island. So I think it's awesome. Which on, which is, let's go. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Charles. Um, so yeah, so what are some things that you help your clients with? Like what are some tips to um get more seen and grow your audience um and sure, get financial gosh, opportunities from hour, social but media? I'm gonna put it into bite-sized tips, three content buckets for Instagram. What are the three main things you want to talk about? And Some of those, for some clients, the three buckets are very similar. Sometimes that's not the case, but you never know who's going to hit what when. So for me, my buckets are acting and that includes promotion. And generally you want to say like add value 80% of the time and only promote 20% of the time. I totally break that rule. I genuinely believe that's the best thing you can do, but it's not always possible. So my acting bucket is like, 
red carpet, promos, shows coming up, headshots. It's a little more glam. I like laugh. I like don't see myself as glam, but you know, we're artists, we're businesses. Like you have to put your best foot forward. So there's that bucket. Then I have my grief bucket, which is a lot more authentic. It's my personal life. Sometimes I combine the two. My, for instance, when I do a stand-up show about grief, that's the way that the buckets are touching. This is inspired by losing my dad to ALS when I was a teenager, and my mom also combats stage four breast cancer at present. She did when I was younger as well. So grief and cancer is its second bucket. And my third bucket is miscellaneous, a hot tip, but it's like that could be if you have a dog that goes in the miscellaneous bucket or it goes with like just something else like funny about your life. I don't do the miscellaneous bucket as much, but like once in a while, I, I call it sometimes with clients, we call it a wild card or miscellaneous. Like sometimes it's fun to just throw something out there like completely different. And there are people in my life that like only care about my dog and nothing else. Like they don't care about like comedy or my acting. And you're like, okay, but now you know who I am. So maybe you'll come to my stand up show just because you have a dog. So having three different things that you rotate between and just being really, really clear about which bucket you're tapping into. I also have like a fourth bucket that's comedic videos. That's like, it can just be like straight up comedy. So if you're adding value, you know, reels are really important. So I'd say have your three buckets, commit to which category you're going through and, and like going all in. I think some people try and do a post that hits everything. So they're like, today I have a girl, I have a girl gang craft and then I have a client and then my dog. It's like, no, what is your post saying? Like have your bucket be fully clear in that post. A, do reels. B, if you're too scared, do stories, but putting yourself on video. And then C, for financial opportunities, it's like reaching out. Like I will cold reach out to companies. It's not glamorous. I don't like doing it. I could do it a lot more and probably make a lot more money. But if there's a brand you're excited about, DM them. And if drafting something each time is exhausting, have something that you copy and paste in your notes folder to reach out to brands for financial opportunities. I do recommend changing the first sentence or two to being more personal. But I'm not going to lie. I have lazy days or like it's my lazy month and I'm just like, nope, they don't get a personal thing this time. So just ha but having like the same um, thing saved on your desktop for emails and in your notes for DMs and reach out. And I'm also a really big fan of voice memos. So this is just kind of across the board. I think it saves a lot of time. It's a lot faster than an email and more personal. And I spent less time. So this is something I do in my daily life. You know, I'm, I'm new to dating. Uh, that always sounds weird, but I was in a long-term relationship for like all of my twenties. So even like for dating, like all voice memo guys. And like, if that like scares them, it's probably not a fit anyways, but it's just like, Hey, it's me. Like, this is what I'm up to. This is what I'm about. So doing that for brand partners specifically, like reaching out, Hey, I'm Chelsea. I have a grief podcast. I see that the founder of your nutrition bar lost her mom maybe there's a way to collaborate so yeah have your content buckets commit put yourself on video reels is the answer and if it's too scary at least do stories and don't be afraid to cold reach out and use a voice memo voice memo last thing i'll say the reason it's so powerful is because it's short and sweet you don't have to type an email and also you don't have to schedule because a lot of brands, you know, sch scheduling phone calls, it's like they're busy, you're on different time zones. You can just send a voice memo into their DM. They can listen on their own time and respond and you saved tons of time. I even have girlfriends. We just catch up about dating their life. I don't know what they're doing. Some of my friends have a two-year-old. Some of my friends have like moved to Italy and are on a boat. Some friends are freezing their eggs. Some friends have a new dog. Like whatever the update is, send it to me in a 10-minute voice memo. I'll send one back to you. We didn't have to use Calendly. I love that. I'm a big voice memo person with oh my, my friends. Oh my gosh, I've been up for I a brand want you to too. try it. That's I'm so, so curious how that goes for you. Yeah. I love it. And I love the thing about brand partners. I think it's really cool and everyone should do it. And yes, you have enough followers to do it. Um, this is I'm just like what in my house do I need right now I am doing I'm not getting paid for this you but I just got an air yeah, conditioner tell me everything. I need to know. I'm doing <laughs> I'm just like I need an air conditioner let me reach out to an air conditioning company and I'm gonna That's do a little amazing with an air and conditioner. it sounds authentic because you actually need one so did you reach out and what did your yeah. collaboration proposal look like yeah 
I just DM'd them. Yeah, I want to hear because my, so my, my steps is, is so I, I definitely de- want to hear what you have to say. Okay. <laughs> so um I DM and it sort of depends. Like I kind of like to think of as my personal account as more lifestyle and GGC a little bit more tech oriented. The air conditioning people do want it on the GGC account, so fine that's fine everyone needs an air conditioner um so my thing is like I dm them I'm just like hi I'm Phoebe I'm the founder of Grog and Craft like um I think my community of of hot people might want an air conditioning this season (laughs) I think I was like I moved to a new apartment in Massachusetts and I don't have an AC like (laughs) I need it to be cute I don't know and um and then like always like what's a good email to reach out to so I'm do move it to email I also also comment on the posts like I sent you a dm I think that's important because people's Mm -hmm. dms get like flooded um, and then they like see who it is, right? And then so we moved to the in- inbox, and this first I was just like, "Let me do a reel for you." And like, it depends, right? Like, often I want to get paid. Often I want to get paid, but like, I needed an air conditioner, so I was okay with a free right. air conditioner exchange for a video. Like, fine. <laughs> so anyways, I love it. And um, they said yeah. yes, and it's so <laughs> one free air conditioner in exchange for a reel. Cool. That seems feasible, you know? One video, yeah. People will watch reels. Yeah. So it's a valuable tool. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So the air conditioner is sitting. It's heavy. It's sitting in my living room because it's been cold this week. But I will put it in on the first hot day and do a little video about it. You go, girl. Well, I can't wait to see it. <laughs> so, I, will con- yeah. I will comment and have a lovely time. <laughs> I will like and comment. I'm Excellent. excited for you Excellent. to try a voice memo. And I sometimes they can accompany each other. <laughs> so if you want the formal language, it's like sometimes you can do a voice memo in addition. Like, hey, it's Phoebe. Just like sometimes I say, I guess this is the way we're connecting in today's world, which is awesome and also funny. But yes, I'm a real person. I just wanted to say hi. It's just like normalizing it and oh my god I think it's gonna work well for you I'm excited I love it I think it's great I love it okay so let's talk about your podcast are you doing brand are you doing like podcast so right um, now, commercial slots for your podcast better help and I partner with a few like BTR okay. bars yeah I have some partnerships mind body green but here's the thing wait is mind body green the name of a podcast that's definitely not one of my partners so we can cut that or I love that that was just in my mind um I'm really specific though I will only partner if the founders of the brand have lost a parent or a sibling because that's my audience I think ultimately I'm set up for success because people are going to trust and believe me because I'm really specific that said if you want to make a coin like you do what you got to do. So I don't judge anyone. And, and I'm all, and I always say I'm open to changing that policy. Like at some point I could change it, but right now it's like a, it's a niche pod. So I have niche partnerships, specifically those who have lost parents and siblings, although better help, you know, I think is its own category, but I, I found my therapist off better help. So I genuinely believe in it. It's mental health based, et cetera. So there's exceptions, but yeah, that's the bulk of what I'm doing. I haven't seen a ton of crossover from, podcast commercials like I feel like it's harder to track and I'm not exactly sure what the point is but for people who have podcasts or thinking getting a podcast I think the reason to do it is you're setting your listeners up to know that like some brand partnerships and commercials will be a part of your show so you're just normalizing it now so if you grow later it's not like all of a sudden now I need to do ads and b you never know even a little bit of change like making a little bit of cash here and there is cool c it's just like people listening to the same thing over time can have a payoff bigger picture. It's also a way to like cross promo with your Instagram. But yeah, I haven't, I don't know. I haven't seen a ton of success from, from mine personally, but I will say I definitely buy stuff that I find out about from other podcasts. So I know it works like from bigger podcasts. I have, I have made purchases. So that's where I'm at. I've taken on a few new like affiliate partnerships recently, which is like its own controversial thing because I feel like just getting paid is better. But if some brands want to send me free product and give me an affiliate link, I'm down to try it. I don't think it will always work. But at least if you're paid in a product that you genuinely want, I'm like, okay, sure. But like, I don't know, there's like dog food companies reaching out to me now. I'm like, 
okay, like I'll try it. If my dog like loves your food, then I will genuinely promo it. Listen, I will take free dog food any really? day. Well, I've been really actually, trying to. I mean, I can connect no you success, with my so dog food you're... people if you want. Um, <laughs> Amazing! Oh Please God. do. She needs. She needs the very best. That's not true. I don't give her like the no, the, it's too much. Whatever, let's, like the no, raw not, stuff. I what are know. you doing <laughs> for your podcast promos? <laughs> I don't do you have just money find for like, that. <laughs> naturally what you're promoting on Instagram like trickles over? Do you make that like a big priority right now? What does that look like for you? Yeah, I think it totally depends. So I definitely use it as like an internal commercial, right. if you will. So we'll talk about the crafters. We'll talk about our classes. We'll, um, we have a lot of tech partnerships, um, that are affiliate based, or sometimes they pay us. For instance, Flowdesk. Um, we have a great relationship with them. Um, Adobe. I'm an ambassador for Adobe. Um, what else? So definitely like tech things that go the question, really you well. Say you're with an what ambassador we're doing. for Adobe. Like, what um, is the main and- Adobe suite or product that you're yeah. using that you find helpful? Because I don't use Adobe that much, but I do use it for like PDFs and like signing things digitally. Is that what you use it for? Like, I'm curious. Yeah. Um, I do Adobe Express. Um, you might be a great ambassador for them. We should talk about that after this podcast. Um, they, I have a year, like I have a continuous contract with them. So it's actually like, okay, let's, let's finish talking about that off off the podcast, (laughs) but, um, I love Adobe, Adobe Express. Um, yeah, so they're great. Um, and what else? Yeah, sometimes I'll just we'll like do like a combination. I mean, the, my next thing is I'm gonna try and like maybe get some stuff donated to the wedding. Oh, cool! And I love offer that. them free podcast slots. <laughs> so we'll see. We're just trying things. You know, it's it's really like hit or miss all the time. Um, often that slot isn't full, but we'll like throw up an affiliate thing there. Um, or and how many ads? Yeah, do you do it totally just podcast? depends. Yeah, I do like, um, like one not more or two, two in pre-roll and then one yeah. or two in mid-roll. What about you? Okay. Yeah, maybe less than that. It depends. It totally depends. Um, cool. And then we do some sponsored episodes also. Um, like we did a sponsored episode with ACT Insurance, um, which is like a craft fair insurance. Um, so that's like super in alignment um what else have we done yeah so it's really all over the place um but yeah tell us more about your podcast um and a little bit more about your work with grief I know you just came back from yes um, grief counselor at a summer camp also all of these are one hour conversations we're just we're just making them into little tiny bits but yeah the podcast is called dying of laughter (laughs) I interview comedians and funny at heart humans with deceased parents and siblings it's also expanded into wellness experts. We've had doctors, genetic counselors, funeral directors, et cetera. So it's normalizing grief through a comedic lens. So it's for people in their 20s and 30s who have lost parents and siblings and also for their friends to find a way to how to support them when they don't know what to say. So, yeah, my parents were diagnosed with ALS and breast cancer when I was in third grade. So I've thought about death for a long time. I also had a cousin when I was four. She died when she was nine in an accident at school and that's obviously really traumatic and upsetting and I just remember the adults sitting me down and how serious that conversation was I I remember her I remember these thoughts and then my dad through ALS was paralyzed for over a decade and that certainly causes you to think about death and certainly when he died it allowed me to think about death so I'm just here to normalize the process a little bit more it's not to make something really sad it's not to think about death all the time and you know it's not going to be for everyone all the time but I think it's important to have conversations with your parents about their will how do they want to be buried do they want to be cremated where's the money how do how do you access their accounts and you know, having your own will. I've had, I threw a funeral theme birthday party. I've had will planning parties. I've just had kind of like fun ways to um, access a normalized grief. So that's what the show is about and just making it a little less scary. It's also reminding people to take care of their own health. Little tidbits are getting a blood test once a year, checking in on your body, like 
I know people who haven't had a blood test in five years. Like, no shame if that's you, but just getting a blood test once a year, seeing a doctor or gynecologist once or twice a year is really important. Um, filling your breasts, doing a self breast exam. All of this might sound overwhelming, but I break it down into episodes so it's a little less scary. And yeah, my mom, you know, she was diagnosed with breast cancer for the second time when I was 25, stage four breast cancer. And so my sister and I thought, you know, we're not going to have parents and like, what the fuck are we going to do about that? And I didn't have a community of people who had lost both their parents. So I decided to create community myself. Fortunately, that is not the case. My mom's been doing well with her cancer for the past six years. That said, um, you know, it's nuanced. She's at UCSF. She has really great care. Not everyone has that. And then cancer is so unique and specific. And some people's cancer will go quickly. Some will last a long time. It's best case scenario that her cancer is lasting a long time because if it didn't, that means she would have died. But it also brings up, you know, just a lot of other things to constantly be worrying about. I will say it's gotten a little less constant over time. It's not the main thing I think about all day, every day anymore for the first two to three years it was. But unfortunately slash fortunately, I consider myself an expert with parents with long-term illnesses. Like that's just my unique experience. So people started calling me and wanting advice and it's really, really personal. And a lot of people don't want that uh, broadcast, but some people do. So we, you know, have those conversations publicly for those who want to do that. And other things that I do, I volunteer as a kids grief counselor every year at grief camp. I'm in a one-to-one -one mentorship program, which is the equivalent of the big sisters program, but specifically for families impacted by cancer. So I've been in a one-to-one -one mentorship program celebrating our three years. Actually today, today is the three-year mark of I've been with one child specifically who lost her mom and did not have a dad. And that's its own hour podcast. And I lead virtual grief groups online through the dinner party. There's a lot of grief shit that I do. But yeah, if you have a parent who gets diagnosed or you just like want to talk about cancer, or death, uh, shoot me a DM at Dying of Laughter Podcast or an email, Dying of Laughter Podcast at gmail.com. I'm happy to just listen and normalize your process. Lots of info. So it's long winded. But yeah, I'm a I'm a grief gal. I love it. I love talking about it. I think that's so cool. I think it's so important to have that outlet for yourself and have that community for yourself and for everyone else. Thanks. Yeah. I'm I sure mean, it's heavy. Like, thing. listen, I've taken breaks too. Like I said, I used to be weekly and for, you know, several reasons, I just was like, this is a lot. So now I'm at seasons and it's like an own break for my mental health. I mean, I'm never fully on a break because I'm always stacking episodes like behind the scenes, but like publicly promoting grief and loss and death every every week was a lot so yeah if it feels heavy like that's cool it is heavy and it's not for everyone and if you don't want to think about it like that's okay too but there's certain there's just there's certain things that I've been exposed to through my personal experiences that I've been like holy shit why don't people know this like why don't we talk about this and I also had their friend friends in their 30s call me sobbing uncontrollably because their grandmother died and let me let me say like grandparents are extremely important and and you and you can and should sob it, it is unbelievably tragic any loss and yet are you sobbing nonstop for a year because your grandma died like maybe that's something we need to look at as a society because best case scenario is your grandparents die and before you and if you have them till you're 30 like that's technically a good thing but you know it depends it's it's all sad it's all hard but my last grandparent also died when i was in high school. So just, you know, all my grandparents had died and then my dad died. And I just thought like, this is hard. This is, this is weird. And as American culture, we, you know, we put people in care homes rather than care for the elderly. So I think it's like less present, like other cultures are caring for the sick and the deceased and the elderly. So they have more access to death for better or worse there's someone that might be dying in your home like eight-year-olds live with their great-grandmothers and and see it firsthand and our culture is more like care home and like the grandparent lives somewhere else and we also as a society we we move we don't all live in like the same small communities we grew up in which is generally a good thing but sometimes it can feel removed so I'm I'm bringing the dead grandparents a little closer that's what I'm doing just kidding but kind of not 
Okay, so one big last question for you. Like, what, how on earth could you balance this all? Love it. And what do you balance do to take care of yourself? Baby? Um, balance is, I would say, like, it depends. I mean, probably, like, people listening who have different jobs or maybe, like, you're also a mom or you're also a dog mom or you have different revenue streams. Like, every day is different, which is exciting, but it's also can be... It has its challenges. Like, I think if you have one main focus, one job, like, you can go farther faster. So I would say how I balance is I focus on my main tasks for that day or that week. And, like, that's my focus. And I'm not going to get to everything every week. And, like, that's okay. So just be nice to yourself if if that resonates with you. In the morning, I'm a big fan of – I. I write down either the night before, if it, if you're like, if you're, um, excuse me, I'll say that again. If you're trying to fall asleep and your thoughts are buzzing, I write down my tasks for the next day, the night before, or sometimes I do it in the morning. So I have three main tasks today that I want to accomplish. These are the three main things I need to hit. And then I have three bonus tasks. So it's like, these are the three things that need to happen for sure. Here's the second three things that could happen. And I balance it into like tech, creative, and personal. So like, Tech is like all the business stuff and like emails I need to send. Creative is like when I have auditions, stand up, like or writing. So maybe if you're, let's say, not an artist, but you're a content creator, like creative would be like videos and brainstorming and like more of the creative side of your business. Maybe, maybe your newsletter is your creative side of your business. I don't know. And then my personal tasks are just like, I need to book doggy daycare, book this flight. Like that's like the boring stuff, but I feel like the personal tasks and the booking and the calendly, like, that I think people can get stuck in because it's like easiest to do but that stuff I do at the end of the day because like I don't want to be spending my day just like booking flights and appointments it's like appointments will come but I think like if you can tackle your hardest task first so the creative stuff doing it first thing in the morning or at least in the first half of the day is powerful and if not then then not like you know our days get crazy I'm also a big fan of 25 five so I do 25 minutes of work five minute break 25 minutes of work five minute break that's another way I stay balanced and stay organized and I also last but not least have a theme of the quarter so for instance like is my quarter focused on developing new stand-up material overall that's the main theme or is my quarter the new podcast season it's not to say my podcast isn't happening all the time but like when it's not launch season my podcast is on the back burner and that's okay and for self-care I'm a big fan of foot massages. They're 20 bucks compared to like $200 massages. So I love a foot massage. Jolly Foot in Los Angeles. Um, not sure where else I would recommend, but like look in your area. Is there a $20 foot massage you can get? I think it's so powerful. Big fan of walks. I don't have time for like crazy hikes. I'm not like so, so, so athletic, but like even walks and Zumba are really helpful. I walk my dog. I have a new dog. You know this. You also have a relatively new dog. What else can I say? I don't know. I like like I love cooking. Um, that's not for everyone, but like that's therapeutic to me. And then I guess just the last tip I'll share is voice memoing is a way to be social even when you are by yourself. So like I have days where I work from home. I have days when my dog can't be left alone. So I have entire days where I'm like I'm home all day today because I have my dog. I take her and we can go to the grocery store. We can get coffees with people, but I have home days and I'm like, okay, I need to be social. And a voice memo is a way you can connect instantly with someone else. And it somehow scratches the itch, even if they don't respond right away. I mean, they're not going to respond right away. That's I'm. I love yes, the voice memo I'm thing. Should that be the title of this episode? I think I've converted like Chelsea everyone and I know voice I'm going to convert you. So yeah, those are my tips and tricks. Uh, what about you? How do you take care of yourself? <laughs> Oh my goodness. Um, how do I take care of myself? Um, I'm doing ceramics. Um, I go to the gym. Um, I, I, I invested oh, in a yes. nice gym. We got the hot tub. We got the sauna. We got the pool. So we're lovely. covering all the seasons here too. Um, and I'm a big walker and coffee. And you yeah, do? We, I go to the dog park oh twice gosh. a day. Does your dog love it? So. Does she run around like crazy? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So it depends who's there. She's like picky. She like has her friends, <laughs> and otherwise she's eating sticks. 
Yeah. So it's like hit or miss. I have to like time it at the right time. Like we went at noon and Rufus was there. So we're good. We're normally good for hours after that. Um, sometimes Matt does the okay, just really shift. quick sometimes while you're here. Go. So so my dog's fun. a stalker. Like, this, um, like there's the expression stage yes. five clinger. Like she's a stage twelve. But I, as part of our training, like I close the door in meetings. I'm like, you can smell me. You know I'm here. But I'm gonna open the door and see if she runs in. Let's just see. Oh my god, she would never do that. God, okay, she wasn't there, which is actually good for her training that she wasn't just at the door. So who knows where she is? Okay, wow. continue. That's awesome. Yeah, well, but then you can really leave her for hours. So she's right like, here. Yeah. How how I many hours a day do you leave her? Would you say I can leave her? It's but okay. Well, I mean, I don't go very many places. I love that for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, but we can we can leave her for six hours. You know, like if we're going to Boston or something. Um, yeah, and but if we're like in if we're if me and Matt are like out together. And one of us like separates what do you from mean? the other. It's chaos. Uh, like if we're like all on a walk and like I go into the store or something. Wait, like, she needs the bananas. two of you to be together. She goes crazy. Dog. Outside, yeah. If we're outside the house, See, we have dogs to all be are so entertaining. They yeah. all have something and then, wackadoodle. I love it. <laughs> it's so wild. <laughs> and then like I can't leave her in a car like if I just go and I mean I do like if I go rent and get a coffee but like she is barking I always and so though, upset the whole time if you can leave your dog at home god bless and I'm gonna get there I'm yeah. not there yeah. I'm gonna get there but like yeah I could leave her in a like You're gonna get a there. coffee fine like out in public fine it's like <laughs> but I love when dogs have weird things like that's so weird that you guys have to be it's, it's together so just yeah quick sidebar one of my best friends who's from mill valley do you know Oliver friedman okay she went to tam why would you i don't think i met her till mm -hmm. i was later in life but anyways she's had a small dog for like seven years like to me i'm always like wait now that i have a dog i'm like wait people have had a dog for seven years like since they were like 23 like that's that's wild she's had this dog no she's okay she just you know now she's in a serious relationship moved in with her partner great has a boyfriend they all live together but now when they go on walks, all three of them, her dog is stoked and runs and is so happy. But when she just walks her dog by herself, her dog is no longer down with that. And she's had this dog for like seven years. I'm like, why? Why does your boyfriend need to be in the walk? Oh, she's like, I don't God. know. Isn't that so funny? I just love shit like That's that. That's hilarious. Really? I mean, is my Matt dog loves one? Matt more than me for sure. Oh my God. <laughs> Matt's number one. I wish for more. more. I need She's to know. my child during the day because he doesn't work at home. I don't. I don't know. We could ask her. Um. Okay. Well, this has been so great, Chelsea. This can was you so tell you, everyone you where we can find you? For the community that you've built and continue to nurture. I'm on Instagram at Chelsea. Who else? So that's like who else would it be with Chelsea? So at Chelsea, who else? You can also Google Chelsea London Lloyd. Or my podcast is at Dying of Laughter Podcast on Instagram. Or feel free to drop me a line at Dying of Laughter Podcast at gmail.com.